Hey everyone, welcome back to Adherent Apologetics. Really pumped you're joining me today. As always, the show is brought to you by you with your support on patreon.com slash Adherent Apologetics. Today I'm here with Joe Schmid. Um, I don't know how long he's going to last here because he's an Arsenal fan, so I might just have to kick him off. But what's up, Joe? How are you doing? I'm doing so well. Uh, come on, you gunners. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, man, if you ever decide you never want to walk alone and become a Liverpool fan, the door is always open. But uh, with the, like philosophy stuff i guess because that's kind of like where you're making your realms can you talk a little bit about like who you are and what you do yeah absolutely so uh yeah like you said i'm joe schmidt um i study philosophy and biology at purdue university uh and i have the the greatest professors ever like paul draper and so on so very excited about that um and i also just do lots of philosophy so that includes a number of things. So first of all, uh, I actually do like, you know, scholarly research and things like that. So that's like writing articles for philosophy journals. Um, you know, my main areas of research are things like metaphysics and philosophy of religion, and in particular, um, models of God and uh, persistence. So like things continuing to exist over time. I also um, write on my blog occasionally, which is called Majesty of Reason. Um, and so that's philosophy related as well. Uh, and then thirdly, I have a YouTube channel, Majesty of Reason, and there I basically go into critical thinking and philosophy. I do interviews with philosophers like Josh Rasmussen, Graham Oppie, Rob Coons, Felipe Leon, Ryan Mullins, and so on. Uh, and I also do like lecture style videos on metaphysics and philosophy of religion. Uh, and then finally, of course, the, my, uh, my book, uh, Ma The Majesty of Reason, A Short Guide to Critical Thinking in Philosophy. So those kind of four things are ma the main things that I do with respect to philosophy. And then of course, on the personal side, I really like soccer, as you can tell. And um, I also like uh, biking and running, so. Good stuff. <laughs> There's a lot on your plate. So the paper is, if I'm right, they're about, uh, is it the first, the Arist Aristotelian argument from Fezzer? Is that kind of what you're going at and like specifically inertia? Yeah, yeah, so that's my, that's the first paper that I've gotten published. And so fingers crossed that I get some other ones uh, published, but I got a lot, of, it's under it's under like a wide range of, of topics within philosophy of religion and metaphysics of ones of papers that I have under review. But yeah, with respect to that, that first paper, it was on, um, yeah, Fezzer's Aristotelian argument. Uh, and I was looking at, um, the nature of persistence in existence and how it relates to that argument. So what, how old, are you 19, 20? I am 20, yes. Okay, wait, when's your birthday? August 6th. I'm, mine's August 11th. Ooh, so you are twins. five days older. <laughs> I thought you were uh, going to be the first person on this channel ever that was actually younger than me, but I guess not. <laughs> close, close. <laughs> So, um, regarding philosophy and religion, obviously, you kind of, you go as an agnostic, and, you know, t today, you know, it can mean so many different things to so many different people. So, like, to you, like, when you're like, I'm Joe, I'm an agnostic, like, what does that mean to you? Yeah, yeah. So, of course, there's, like, the backstory element to it, like, how you come to it. Uh, mm -hmm. So, there's the backstory to it. There's also the, the justificatory aspect to it. So, like, what reasons do you have for holding to your position? And then there's also, like, spelling out the position itself. So, just the kind of taxonomic aspect to it. So, with respect to the taxonomic aspect, um, yeah, so I break down agnostics into a few different categories. So, one of them is a kind of in-principle agnostic, where this individual would say that, like, it is in principle not possible to know whether or not God exists, say. Mm -hmm. I should specify that agnostic, uh, usually that's in relation to God's existence, but agnosticism that applies to pretty much, um, you can, it's always agnosticism with respect to cer a certain domain, right? So mm -hmm. you can be agnostic on whether or not there are aliens, like I, I am, as well. <laughs> like, I don't know if there are aliens. Um, but, you know, with respect to God's existence, um, this is where my taxonomy comes in. So, like I said, the in-principle agnostic says that it's not possible to know in principle whether or not God exists. There's also what I call an epistemic agnostic, and this is the one that I fall under. And that says that, well, roughly, once, once I've evaluated the evidence and looked at it on both sides, it seems to counterbalance approximately. So then you kind of are left in the middle, as it were. Um, uh, you don't commit either to theism or atheism. You just kind of have a, a credence level that's roughly uh, halfway between them. And then finally, there's a kind of uh, suspension agnosticism where you just you you just completely suspend any assignments. You, you might not say that it's impossible in principle to know, but you just completely suspend any probability assignments as to whether or not God exists. Whereas the epistemic agnostic would say it's roughly halfway. Mm -hmm. So that's like a definite probability assignment. Um, so yeah, I'd, fa I'd fall, you know, roughly into that kind of epistemic agnostic category. 
Yeah. So like, what's kind of like your journey look like? So you're like, you're an agnostic now, obviously you probably weren't an agnostic your whole life, but like, what's kind of the story of Joe Schmidt in these 20 years and like a month and some change of um, how you got to where you are today regarding your beliefs on this, like whole theism, atheism. And then obviously you don't want to forget, like you got pantheism and panentheism and all these other fun things. Like what's your journey? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, with respect to like, uh, the reasons, I guess, you know, I, I, I'll get to like the journey in just one second. But with respect to the reasons, of course, for those of you who are watching, I would suggest it's one of the favorite, my, one of the favorite videos that I've made. Um, really, it's called uh, Why Am I Agnostic? It's a, it's a video on my channel. So I, I highly recommend you, you guys look at that. That kind of goes into discussing, well, <laughs> why I am agnostic, but also <laughs> the different kinds, the different kinds of agnosticism, a survey of different arguments for and against God's existence that I find persuasive, um, a discussion of different models of God, uh, and also a recommendation for further like scholarly and philosophical resources on both sides of the debate. Um, and so that's kind of by way of the, the reasons as it were. Um, but as for like how I've, you know, my views have kind of changed over time and how I've evolved to here. So I began as a, as a devout Christian. I grew up Christian. Um, and I really, I always loved science uh, in addition to other things, of course, but I've, I've always loved science, especially evolutionary biology. It like captivated me that we could have all this biological diversity um, just arise from such simple origins, right? That was so beautiful, um, you know, just looking at my hand, it's like this was formed over hundreds of millions of years. It's like insane, it's so mm -hmm. cool. Um, and so I loved evolutionary biology, um, but you know, around ninth-ish grade, um, I started reflecting on you know, some of some of the more negative aspects of evolution, you know, uh, the sheer horrors that we might think are present in the evolutionary process, right? So for hundreds of millions of years, right, non-human animals have experienced s profound suffering and death and predation and carnivory and disease and parasitism and languishing, right? And it seemed to me at the time that like, oh man, this is the very means by which God is creating biological diversity and humans in particular. And so this led me to kind of further question things, read philosophy quite voraciously, uh, and that eventually led me to becoming an atheist or a metaphysical naturalist. Um, and then, uh, you know, later on, as I move through high school, I'm developing and becoming more sophisticated. Um, I'm starting to read in depth about the PSR, the principle of sufficient reason, and cosmological arguments from contingency. Um, and those, along with like a bajillion other factors, kind of shifted me more towards agnosticism, uh, away from atheism and away from metaphysical naturalism and towards agnosticism. And that's where I am presently. So yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of the journey. Man, I feel like everyone has a bone to pick with you then. Like you have the Christians that are mad at you for leaving Christianity, then you got the atheists that'll be mad at you for like leaving like metaphysical <laughs> naturalism. So like, it's tough, bro. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I also, I like to see it as kind of building bridges. So hopefully, hopefully it's not like, angry but more so building bridges between different different tribes as it were so that that's that's the goal yeah and i think it's something that i mean i'm not super in depth on the philosophical literature but from what i understand like in philosophy usually people are a lot more like unified in terms of just like seeking truth and you have like this whole like youtube thing where it's like everyone's on these sides and everyone else is just like biased or dumb or ignorant or one of these things and then there's just like philosophers who are like dude come on come on biased. <laughs> exactly no no that's that's so true and um yeah philosophers really are unified around this goal of truth and they they try to improve each other's arguments even on the other side as it were like they're trying to steel man them and, and develop them and give them their proper due and so on so it is it is a different uh different species from the youtube interactions but there are lots of YouTube channels like yours and mine and a bunch of others that are trying to elevate that 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 level of discourse. I don't know about yours. I don't think an Arsenal fan can have a good <laughs> channel. Probably not. I don't have anything against Arsenal. I just like to make fun of Arsenal. Yeah, fans, yeah. But yeah, your channel is an amazing resource when I've seen like you're getting these conversations and you're having like basically like the top dogs and really Christianity and atheism representing both sides really well. It's like what was like the inspiration behind starting like Majesty of Reason? Yeah, yeah. So... I, I mean, I made this blog way back, um, I don't remember, maybe it was 2018, maybe when I made it, um, maybe it was 2017, I think it was 2018. It was originally called something else, I think it was like naturalistically inclined or something, because that's when I was a naturalist or whatever, mm -hmm. um, back in like 2017, 2018 or whatever. Um, and, you know, as I, you know, developed and shifted more towards agnosticism, I wanted to have a more neutral name. And I was always struck by this quote from Baruch Spinoza, which is just, uh, what altar of refuge can a man find for himself when he commits treason against the majesty of reason? Mm -hmm. So I've always loved that quote. 
And it's just such a beautiful quote and that majesty of reason part, I love it. And so I just, I'm like, Hey, I'm going to name my blog after that. And so I start blogging and then I, you know, my blog gets a little bit bigger and it starts, you know, going up. And so now I'm getting a little bit more interested in publicizing and, you know, uh, articulating my arguments more publicly. And then, you know, one thing leads to another and eventually you've got a YouTube channel. So <laughs> yeah, it's one of the best YouTube channels out there. It's permanently underscribed. Um, so I encourage everyone, if you're listening, you can check out and subscribe to Majesty of Reason on YouTube. But so obviously you talked a little bit about like, um, you were a naturalist and then you kind of saw some arguments for God go theism. Um, What's like your general thoughts? Obviously, there's a lot of different kinds of like arguments for the existence of God. But like when you look at these like arguments for theism as a whole, like what do you see through your eyes? Yeah, that's a good question. So I like to conceive of arguments as oftentimes person based. So when you're coming to arguments, you're coming to them with kind of a, a backdrop. You're coming to them with your own uh, seemings. So certain things seem to be the case. Certain things seem more plausible to you than not. You already have certain preconceptions about the world. You already have kind of a metaphysical and epistemological backdrop. You have your prior probabilities that you would assign to things. So some things seem, you know, just on the face of it, quite implausible or quite low speaking, probabilistically wise, mm -hmm. right? And so oftentimes when we come to arguments, we're already coming with this complete sort of worldview and oftentimes like a worked out um, account of reality, or at least, at least a worked out account of what things we find more plausible and less plausible. And so what that means is that argument evaluation is really gonna be quite heavily dependent uh, on your own kind of epistemic position, your own position on this grand landscape that we all occupy, uh, you know, depending on our prior beliefs and our prior um, seemings and so on. And so what that means is that um, arguments, how I conceive of them, it's like some of them are gonna be successful for some people and not successful for others. And others are gonna find them more plausible and others are not gonna find them as plausible. That's not to commit to some sort of relativism. It's just to recognize mm -hmm. that uh, the, our judgments of the plausibility of certain premises and the plausibility of certain arguments in favor of certain premises is gonna depend quite heavily on a lot of our, our backdrop that I was talking about earlier. And so that's kind of how I view arguments. And so I think that um, when I view these arguments in philosophy of religion, I view them as uh, really people confessing what seems to them to be to be the case, and what what kind of convinces them, and you know they're trying to help others see what they think they see, and so it's really all about sharing sight. It's trying to help others appreciate what you think you see, um, and yeah, so it's really this sort of mutual collective enterprise of trying to help each other gain greater sight about the nature of reality and our place in it. So. Mm. Yeah, really good stuff. So let's dive into a few of these arguments. In case uh, anyone listening doesn't know, this isn't like a debate. Joe would probably destroy me. Um, Joe, I could probably be the atheist, and Joe would still destroy me as the theist. Um, but we'll go into some of these arguments. I listened to, thinking about this conversation, I listened to your conversation with Randall Rouser, the devil's advocate debate. I was like, dang, this guy sounds like a pretty smart theist. And, um, but let's talk about some of these arguments. Um, which is with contingency, obviously there's different forms, but I know you're kind of like on board with the idea of some sort of like necessary foundation, but you don't really see it necessarily being God. So can you talk a bit like, like walk through your thoughts on like these arguments from contingency? Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to arguments from contingency, I like to break these down into two stages, right? So stage one is about, um, usually it's about explaining some broad feature of reality, whether contingent objects, maybe contingent states of affairs, maybe it's sort of global contingent states of affairs or maybe you're focusing on one contingent thing and you want to find a full explanation of it so you're trying to explain some feature of reality usually a broad feature of reality and the argument usually takes you in stage one to some kind of foundation or some kind of unexplained explainer of that feature of reality or one or more unexplained explainers mm -hmm. and so that's kind of stage one you get to this kind of foundation this kind of unexplained explainer maybe it's multiple um and then stage two tries to take what we learned from stage one and perhaps in conjunction with conceptual analysis and various other uh, auxiliary hypotheses and theses, it tries to identify that foundation or that unexplained explainer with God. So uh, you try to you know, tease out various inferences that you can make from either the concept of a necessary being or the concept of an unexplained explainer, or you look at its explanatory role um, and you try to show that it is God, right? And so, you know, as you said, there are lots of different types of contingency arguments. And so I'm not convinced by all stage one contingency arguments, of course, but I do find many stage one contingency arguments rather plausible. Mm -hmm. So um, Alexander Proust has a book 
called the principle sufficient reason, a reassessment, wherein he gives some pretty forceful reasons for thinking that the principle sufficient reason is true. And I do think that once you accept the principle sufficient reason, it's, you know, it's, it's a rather swift route to a necessary being. Because once you accept the principle sufficient reason, you have to have some sort of reason or account for why there are contingent things. Um, and ultimately, arguably, that's, that's probably going to bottom out in a necessary, necessarily existent being or beings, right? Mm -hmm. um, and being that, of course, some people get caught up on that term. It doesn't specifically mean a kind of intelligence or kind of spooky. When philosophers say that, they just, of course, mean something like a concrete object. So um, think of it more like an entity or an object uh, for the audience. Um, so I do find stage one of some of some such arguments rather plausible. That's not to say I think it's like decisive or it demonstrates something or it rationally compels people. Um, but from my own perspective, I, I do think that they're quite plausible. And so what that means is that I think it's plausible that there is some sort of necessary reality, some sort of necessary entity or group of entities. Now the difficulty is when when we get into stage two. Yeah. So that's really where I, I hop off the train and I'm like, no, these arguments are not that, to my mind, they, they don't seem convincing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, there are a bunch of different ways we might try to infer God's existence from necessary being, like that sole concept. But uh, to my mind, I think that um, from the arguments that I've evaluated, I think that I, uh, for my epistemic stance, the proper stance right now is agnosticism with respect to the intrinsic nature or character of this particular necessary foundation. Now, mm. it could be a naturalistic foundation, so it might be a, a single quantum field that underlies uh, the less fundamental contingent things like you and me, so that would kind of be an ultimate naturalistic explanation. It could be a collection of fundamental particles. It might be... Um, you know, matter, energy, or whatever. Uh, or it could be uh, some form of theism. So it could be, th this foundation could be God, say. Uh, so I, I, you know, this is an active area of investigation for me in my intellectual life. But roughly speaking, that's that's my take on contingency arguments. So roughly, for the most part, I'm okay with stage one for, for, for a lot of them, not all of them. But for stage two, I'm not really convinced by the arguments mm. proffered on behalf of that. Mm. You're not quite new. <laughs> um, so, uh, first off, thank you, Steve, for opening the super chat. We're going to get some questions at the end, but for now, we're going to keep this train rolling. So, like, what's kind of like, obviously, you know, people like an Alexander Proust or Josh Rasmussen have done a lot of work on, like, these arguments from contingencies. So, like, is there, like, some, like, one sort of, like, big, maybe, like, objection you have or sticking point, like, somewhere you, like, cross the line in the sand? Like, what's kind of, like, the big thing that kind of holds you back from like accepting like some sort of theism um, regarding this idea of whatever this necessary being is? Absolutely. So that's a good question. There are a number of ways uh, I could I could take that. Um, so one way is uh, one way is why do I have sort of positive reasons for thinking that it's not God? This necessary foundation mm -hmm. is not God. The other one is if I simply don't have positive reasons for thinking that it is God. Right. So it's sort of yeah. there are two sides. So um, taking on that first side, right, of if I have positive reasons for thinking it might not be God, um, th that would come into certain arguments that I think might favor atheism over theism, right? Mm -hmm. So that would go into like evolutionary evil and various other arguments, which we'll go on later. We'll talk about that later yeah. in, this, in this discussion. So we can set those aside for now. So that might be one reason why I bring that in there or a collection of reasons. Um, but there's also that, that second thing that I was mentioning, which is just um, for my own position on the epistemological landscape, uh, my absence of reasons for identifying with this being or beings with God, right? Uh, and so it mainly in the context of stage two, it does go down to I'm, I don't find the arguments identifying that being with God convincing. One such argument, for instance, is a kind of argument from limits. So you might think that, well, if you look around us, uh, the limited things of our experience seem to be contingent in various ways. And limits you know, seem to be a hallmark of contingency, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we have a necessary thing, well, then it's not gonna have any limits, in which case it's gonna be an unlimited being. It's gonna be unbounded in value. It's gonna be supreme in value. It's gonna be perfect. And so I have a, a, a number of reservations on this argument and it would probably take hours upon hours to spell them <laughs> out. And I've gone back and forth with, with Josh Rasmussen in email discussion so, um, on this, but um, uh, long story short, I, I don't think that uh, limitation is an essential feature only of contingent things. I think it's entirely 
possible and reasonable to think that there are certain necessarily existent limits at the foundation, say, um, and those might be explained either in terms of uh, the necessity of those limits or perhaps some deeper explanation. Um, but anyway, that would, we're getting a little bit too ahead of, <laughs> too ahead of ourselves. Long story short, um, I'm just not really convinced by those stage two arguments. Um, and stage one, normally I don't have too much of a problem with that. Mm. Yeah, well, I appreciate you bringing up the idea of the limits because I think that it's one of definitely the more intriguing arguments that I found kind of like when you look at this thing, like uh, whatever this sort of necessary being is. So appreciate you bringing it up and I guess we'll have to hold it there for now because there's a lot of stuff. Uh, let's talk about casual, ca casual, oh my God. <laughs> casual finicism for a little bit. So, like, you know, it's kind of like you have William Lane Craig with his famous Kalam cosmological argument, which is a very simplified version of this idea of causal finitism. There must be a first cause. If there's a first cause, there must be it must be God. Is basically the way it goes for a theist. Um, so, like, when you look at this idea of like causal fit. I can't say the word, causal finitism. Like, what's kind of your thoughts on this, like, argument as a whole? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So causal finitism for the audience is just the view that every event or state has a finite causal history. So you can't, you essentially cannot have infinitely many events causing one another, one after another, or infinitely many substances causing one another in a kind of infinite causal chain. That's what this view says you can't have. Now, it's usually motivated, excuse me, it's usually motivated via paradoxes. So for instance, you have the Grim Reaper paradox. So we can imagine that, let's say I'm going to be up at uh, midnight tonight and I'm hoping to stay alive till 1 a.m. because you know, it's a Friday night. I wanna, you know, I wanna go out party, do some like massive drugs, things like that. Like as I'd always do. No, <laughs> I can kidding. see that, I see you being there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've got my massive drugs, which are just philosophy papers that I'm injecting. Um, Anyway, I want to stay up till 1 a.m., okay? But we've got these, this infinite series of Grim Reapers, right? And so Grim Reaper number one is set to kill me at 1 a.m., uh, if and only if no earlier Grim Reaper does. But we've got a Grim Reaper number two that's going to do the same thing at 12.30, if and only if no Grim Reaper earlier than him does. But we've got Grim Reaper number three who's going to do the same thing at 12.15 a.m., and so on. And so we get infinitely many uh, Grim Reapers in between 12 and 1 o'clock. Now, the question is, do I survive until 1 o'clock? Well, the answer is obviously no, because if I survive till one o'clock, well, then the 12.30 Grim Reaper would have killed me, obviously, right? But, you know, no Grim Reaper killed me, right? For any Grim Reaper you pick, there were infinitely many Grim Reapers before him who would have carried out their job. You never die. Like, God, you yeah. just always exist. Exactly, right? So I'm somehow killed, but I'm also not killed, which is just absurd, right? And so we, we have this kind of Grim Reaper paradox, and what, what proponents of the argument argue is that, well, there's some sort of culprit. We went wrong somewhere. And the place that we went wrong is allowing these kind of infinite causal chains. Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of general argumentative strategy for causal finitism. Now, one difficulty with this approach that I find is that there are always ways to kill a paradox that don't involve causal finitism. So for instance, you can always adopt a kind of discrete time or discrete space, or you could simply debar action at a distance, or you could hold that um, causal influence can travel only at or below the speed of light, say. Um, or you could also reject the paradox not in virtue of causal finitism, but instead simply in virtue of its being metaphysically impossible to obtain. And so, and so on, right? There are lots of different other ways you can kill the paradox that don't adduce causal finitism. Now, um, the Alex Malpass, he actually has a forthcoming paper detailing an alternative solution um, that other philosophers have raised in connection to the paradoxes of time travel. And so what it's actually called is it's called the unsatisfiable pair diagnosis or UPD. Mm -hmm. And essentially, many of the paradoxes that thinkers like Proust and Kuhn's level in favor of causal finitism simply have a contradictory setup from the get go one that is strictly logically impossible for reasons that have nothing to do with causal, with infinite causal chains. I'm not saying that it, that applies to all of them, but many of them like the Grim Reaper paradox and the paper passer paradox. Um, so I'm not, note that I'm not saying this about all of the infinite paradoxes. Um, but as Alex Malpas points out in his forthcoming paper, um, this contradictory setup is it's logically impossible for reasons that don't have that have nothing to do with infinite causal chains, um, and it's precisely because they all rely on the following unsatisfiable pair. That is to say, a pair or two, a pair of theses 
or hype or claims that cannot be satisfied together in a given situation um, because you can like literally derive a logical contradiction just from these two claims. So the two claims are uh, firstly, for some set S, that set S has no first member. So it's kind of like a, an infinite chain or an infinite uh, set. And then the second claim within this unsatisfiable pair is for all members X within that set S, something obtains at member X, if and only if it doesn't obtain anywhere before or anywhere sort of earlier than or anywhere before in the function X, right? So uh, again, you can kind of see how this abstract pattern applies to that, that um, Grim Reaper case, right? We had the set with no first member, which was the infinite number of, of Grim Reapers. And each Grim Reaper, right, for all X in S, that set S, that Grim Reaper killed Fred if and only if no earlier Grim Reaper did. So we have this E at X, this some, something is true at X, if and only if something is true nowhere, nowhere before it, right? So, um, but what you can actually do is you can derive a logical, it's actually kind of a complicated derivation, um, but you can derive a logical contradiction just from these two claims utterly in the abstract. Um, and so the best way to argue for causal finitism, I think, uh, is really to say that it provides a kind of elegant unifying solution to a wide array of infinitary paradoxes, right? So although no particular paradox can prove causal finitism, because again, you can rule it out by other means, um, the best way to argue for causal finitism is to say that it just it's a sort of unifying, simple, elegant explanation. Now, one difficulty with that, of course, is that there may be other elegant unifying solutions, like that unsatisfiable pair diagnosis, because that kind of kills a lot of paradoxes as well. And so I defer listeners to Alex Malpas's excellent paper on this. Um, it's actually, unfortunately, it's not available to the public yet. It's, it's forthcoming, which means it's accepted, but it's not published yet. So, um, but I, I do plan to have Alex Malpass and Rob Coons on my channel at some point to discuss the paper. So that's something to look forward to. Um, so that, that's one thing that I would say. I just have some reservations about deriving causal finitism from these paradoxes. Um, and then finally, I will say, um, this will be the last thing that I say on this. Um, <laughs> Uh, even supposing we establish causal finitism, it is difficult to bridge that gap again to God, because now we're going back to that stage two worries. Because again, we're going to have stage one and stage two in these causal finitist arguments. Stage one gets you to a first cause from causal finitism and various other things, and then stage two is trying to get you from first cause to God. And so I do find certain difficulties in that, uh, and I do think that there are naturalist-friendly or atheist-friendly accounts of the nature or character of this first cause. Yeah, man, there's so much good stuff there. It's crazy just how in depth we can go with all this philosophy mm -hmm. stuff. So, free will is a really interesting idea. I know you brought this up, and you're like one of a couple people that I've seen like bring this argument up. I know Braxton Hunter has obviously a little bit different route that he's taken, uh, but this whole idea of free will, like, it's a big debate in philosophy. I'm trying, I think it's like, I saw in the Phil Paper survey, it's like 60% compatibilist, compatibilist, yeah. and then like 15%, like, hardcore determinists and libertarian freedom mm -hmm. uh, people. So like when you look at this idea of like free will, there's so much here. So like when you look at this, like what are you thinking? Yeah, well, it's the the literature is just voluminous. It's like you, it's crazy. Like I would not want to like try to go into, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't want to try to go into like try and publish papers on it because there's just so much that you have to like know and read and keep up with. Yeah, the debates are absolutely voluminous. As you said, most philosophers are compatibilists. So they, they believe that there is free will and this free will uh, gives us moral responsibility. It's a kind of free will worth wanting, um, but it's compatible in the sense that the compatible with determinism. So the truth of determinism, whether causal or otherwise. So um, they're gonna say that our actions are causally determined by, by, by various prior factors, maybe our reasons and our desires and our psychological state, maybe it's certain neurophysiological, you know, chemical reactions or so on, but they're also, they're gonna wanna say that nevertheless, we do have free will and uh, it's a free will that confers moral responsibility. Maybe it's not the robust kind of free will that libertarians say that we have, whereas it's kind of this like brute power to do otherwise completely. Um, but yeah, so most philosophers are cool with some kind of free will. As you said, hard determinists are in the minority. Um, now, libertarians are also in the minority as well, uh, but all we need is like some kind of free will that gives us more responsibility for the argument to go and to get up and running. So that that's a sort of preliminary, right? So that that's kind of the debate about free will. We can set that aside. We can just assume at least that we have some kind of free will, whether it's compatibilist or libertarian. Let's just put that aside. Now, 
once we get that, I do think that this, this does provide, free will does provide evidence for theism. And you can, you can kind of, the way I like to approach it is by means of a Bayesian argument. So Bayesianism really just looks at different hypotheses and different evidences and says, what would we expect if a given hypothesis is true, right? So if theism were true, what would we expect? And then we compare that with a different hypothesis. If naturalism were true, what would we expect about reality or about some domain? And if we find out that some piece of data or some piece of evidence is much more expected or alternatively, much less surprising, much less mysterious on one hypothesis as opposed to another, then that piece of evidence would provide evidence, good evidence or good reason to favor this hypothesis over this other hypothesis. So that's kind of the basics of, of Bayes' theorem that underlies the argument. And so what the, how the argument goes is that, well, listen, if theism were true, you know, it's, it's certainly not surprising that there would be free will. I mean, free will is so valuable. It allows us to have a relationship with God. It allows us to have relationships with one another, to be morally responsible. It, it just brings so much value, right? And so it's actually kind of expected under theism that there would be kind of a morally significant free will. But on the contrary, on, under naturalism, it seems much less expected. It seems much more surprising. That's not to say that it would be utterly incoherent or absolutely impossible, but it's just to say it just doesn't seem as expected. Naturalism, kind of its fundamental building blocks of reality are unfree and unconscious bits of physical stuff, right? And so it's difficult to see how those could have any kind of preference for you know, giving rise not only to an evolutionary process, but also to consciousness and also to uh, things that have this kind of irreducible causal power to initiate free actions. So there are a lot of probability hurdles for naturalism that don't seem to afflict theism. So that's kind of the argument, and hence it would provide evidence for theism. And I have to say, like, I think, yes, this is, this is evidence for theism. I do think that that's true. Um, and what's also important to, to recognize is that uh, when you're doing these assessments of these various hypotheses and these different theories, you have to take into account the full range of evidence. So also, you know, we're going to have to evaluate different pieces of evidence from evil and from evolution and from, uh, you know, the cosmos and, and other things, right? So um, I do think that this provides evidence for, for theism. And of course, I think that there are all other evidences for theism and other, other evidences for naturalism, so. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about like uh, arguments for naturalism. I definitely, I know you've brought up this idea of like this whole idea from evolution, which in my opinion is probably the most powerful argument um, for atheism outside of the, if there's just no good arguments for God's, God's existence. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, when you look at it, it's like, this idea of naturalism, like what are some of the key arguments that you see that for like a metaphysical naturalism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for the audience, uh, metaphysical naturalism is essentially just the view that no God or nothing like God exists, essentially. So it's kind of like atheism, but it also disallows other supernatural things like lesser gods or things like angels and demons and so on. So it would just say the ca causal reality is exhausted by natural things. Um, natural is a bit difficult to define, but we can kind of think of it like spatiotemporal things, right? Like this cup and trees and you and me, we're kind of situated in space time, we're kind of physical things, um, things like that. So that, that, that's kind of the, the naturalist story, the naturalist picture. Now, there are a bunch of, a variety of different arguments that one might level in favor of naturalism, either by going in, maybe either attacking theism, its main alternative, its main rival, or just providing, you know, the kind of Bayesian pieces of evidence for naturalism. So one reason is, of course, the kind of evolutionary argument from evil, right? So under naturalism, you know, if, the, if evolution is going to occur under naturalism, reality is fundamentally indifferent to the suffering and languishing of creatures. And so what that means is that it's not very surprising if we get this really grueling, really cruel evolutionary process that's long and protracted and has just a profusion of intense suffering uh, that seems careless and, and so on, that seems just indifferent. Um, and so that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be very surprising under naturalism. Whereas under theism, we might think that that's quite surprising. I mean, um, God's supposed to have full and radical providence over not only creation, but the way he creates. So it seems a bit surprising that he would literally create by means of hundreds of millions of years of non-human animal suffering. Again, that's non-human animals. So it's not as though they're like, um, these things are like, you know, sacrificing themselves for one another in order to develop their virtue because, you know, the virtue and these sorts of moral character things are distinctly human things because we have an intellect and we can sort of cognize that. Um, so we might think that that's one argument for naturalism, the kind of evolutionary argument from evil. 
Now, I'm just going to list a few others as well. Um, so there's an argument from horrors. So this is a different argument from evil. And it focuses on instances of evil that just seem intrinsically impermissible for anyone who is in control of them to allow them to occur. Um, and so it, it kind of, again, like, uh, it doesn't say that we can prove that these things are intrinsically impermissible. But it says that, you know, we just have this seeming. We just can kind of, it just seems to be the case. And again, that's that, that is kind of the basis of a lot of, a lot of arguments. It's just, this is how it seems to me. So they have this seeming of it being intrinsically impermissible. Um, if you read the accounts of the Holocaust, if you read the accounts of, uh, you know, torturings and other things, uh, you can kind of get this distinct sense that, like, this is not permissible. This is intrinsically impermissible, not just for the people who are doing it, but for anyone in control of the situation uh, who could have prevented it to allow that to happen. And it particularly focuses on the horrors aspect of it. So like really horrendous bits of suffering. Now, that is a, that's a separate kind of uh, argument from evil. So there are also non-evil sources of evidence for naturalism. So we might think that naturalism is simpler than theism. It doesn't posit this additional entity beyond nature that accounts for nature. Um, we might think that naturalism can provide, this is, this is how Oppie goes about arguing for naturalism. He says that naturalism can provide, um, he says that naturalism can explain pretty much most things that theism does, at least equivalently, but naturalism wins out, has an advantage on simplicity, and hence, all else being equal, naturalism is probably true. Uh, in relation to theism, at least, right? So that's his kind of argument. He says, listen, we, we can explain the things that theism attempts to explain uh, just as well on naturalism, but naturalism is simpler, and hence a global theoretical comparison can help us take naturalism on board. So that's Oppie's kind of argument. Um, so that's one reason someone might be a naturalist. There are also other reasons that someone might be a naturalist. So uh, someone might think that there are particular problems for each model of God, right? So there's this huge debate in theological and philosophical circles about if God exists, what is God's nature like? And there are a bunch of different models. So there's like classical theism, there's a kind of modified or neoclassical theism, there's penentheism, there's pantheism, right? And so we might actually say like, each of these models has their distinctive problems. That's not to say that they're insuperable, they're not, you can't overcome them, but each of these models has their own distinctive problems. And so what the naturalist says, the naturalist can like, kind of take this, take each of the problems for each of the models and be like, listen, you guys have so many problems for each of these particular models such that naturalism is just, it's gonna win out for any model, for any model of God that you pick, those, it'll, it'll be plagued by those kind of problems that afflict that model. And so naturalism is gonna win out as it were up against that model. I'm not, again, I'm not claiming that any of these like succeed or fail. I'm kind of giving a lay of the land. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wanna go over maybe two more uh, really yeah, briefly. So. One of them is uh, from material causality from Dr. Felipe Leon. So he has an argument that goes something like, uh, for any material object that begins to exist, so for any material object, material thing that comes into existence, it has a material cause. Uh, it has a material cause. So uh, that is to say, it has that from which it is made. It has, it has a material out of which it comes to be. And so he argues for, uh, uh, he goes through a variety of different philosophical and empirical justifications for this. And then he goes on to argue that, well, if traditional theism is true, well, then there is at least one concrete, one concrete material object, namely the universe itself, that comes into existence without a material cause. That is to say, ex nihilo, right? That, that's part of traditional theism. So if that first premise is true, that that's not possible, and that traditional theism entails it, then traditional theism is not possible. Mm -hmm. So the argument goes, right? And so he goes through that argument. Um, it's a really interesting argument. That's, that's another thing that might push one towards naturalism. Um, and then finally, uh, I guess there are, there are a bunch of different Bayesian arguments that people like Paul Draper and Jeff Lauder and Dan Linford have developed that look at um, things like the distribution of, of uh, evil, maybe the distribution of hiddenness, uh, various facts about geography and justice and how divine justice relates to the geographical distribution of um, pains and pleasures and things like that, um, and a bunch of other different really interesting things. Um, and then finally, okay, this is one final thing. One might think that abstracta, well, abstract is a problem for everyone, but abstract, one might think that abstract objects like numbers and propositions and things like that uh, provide, you know, some reason to think uh, it, there's something going, going wrong here with theism. Why is that? Well, because William Lane Craig, for those of you who follow William Lane Craig's work, 
he actually wrestled with the problem of abstracta for so long. He thought that the challenge of Platonism, for instance, was one of the biggest problems for theism. Because if Platonism is true, well, then we have this infinite realm of uncreated, necessarily existent abstracta. And so then God wouldn't be the sole ultimate source from which everything derives its being. And so God wouldn't really have this kind of radical ultimacy that we need God to have. And so abstracta, it's actually really difficult to, to have a realist version of abstracta with um, forms of theism, because you might have to have a kind of theistic conceptualism. So that is to say abstract are kind of divine thoughts. And that's going to be very difficult because that has a bunch of different problems. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So <laughs> I, should probably, I should probably stop. But abstract is kind of a problem for everyone. But one might think that, that that gives reason to think that theism isn't true because there couldn't simply be this ultimate source of everything because there would have to be these abstracta that are uncreated or whatever. So that's my that's my rough taxonomy of different kinds of arguments that one might level. So again, it's not exhaustive, it's not representative, but I hope that gives the audience an appreciation, at least, for why one might become a naturalist. You're telling me you can't like summarize all the centuries of arguments for atheism in like 10 minutes? Uh, I mean, if you gave me 12, <laughs> there we go. If if Joe can do this in under 10 minutes, therefore God exists. That sounds like a pretty sound argument to me. Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> uh, we'll go to one last question here. We'll go to a little bit of Q&A. Um, so obviously you were a theist, you were an atheist. What could lead you in either direction kind of to wrap things up here? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, I mean, there are infinitely many things that like, okay, well, speaking roughly, like there are many. Okay, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of different things that, that influence our beliefs. Um, and as we know from the psychological literature, uh, for the most part, for anyone, for anyone, I'm going to repeat that, for anyone, it is never the rational considerations alone that leads them to believe the things that they do. Uh, there, are, It's a whole concoction of uh, psychological, emotional, social, um, political, uh, geographical, environmental, and philosophical um, influences or determinants of our beliefs. Now, that's not to say that you know you like don't have any influence over it and you don't have any uh, philosophical reasons for it. It's just to say that um, it is very rare to be able to have a position that you have solely, solely on the basis of argumentation and reasons and so on. That's the only reason why you accept it. So, with that being said, I do want to say like. I want to say that, that what would change my mind is a good argument or rather a collection of good arguments one that favor one direction over the other. So I do think that there are good arguments on both sides. What I would need to do is either take, a, take away some arguments from this side that I, that I no longer find plausible and hence remain, keep these ones on the other side and yeah, so yeah. it would tell me this side. Um, or maybe we could like increase the number here and so you know maybe I would have more on this side. So really it's like either... Uh, strengthening of arguments that I previously previously thought weren't so strong, or maybe gaining new arguments or a collection of said arguments. I think I think it would be a, like a successful or good argument from my position on the epistemological landscape that would be able to kind of change my mind on this. And with that being said, I, I did want to give that caveat earlier that while I am saying now that it's it's what is a good argument that that what it would take to convince me um, for anyone, that's not going to be the only thing. And there are going to be a lot of other psychological and social and emotional factors that influence it well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so mainly, mainly a good argument, but also I, I can't, I, I don't know what, what it, what those other factors would be. So that's kind of uh, below my consciousness sort of. So mm. Did you, one last thing I'm going to squeeze in here before we get to a couple of questions. Uh, what about like this idea of personal experience? Obviously there's so much we could probably dive into here, but just in like 30 seconds or a minute, like, do you think any sort of like personal experience Cause for a lot of things, it's like the evidence plus a personal experience or a personal experience led them to the evidence. Like it, very briefly, like, what do you think about this whole idea of like a personal experience? Yeah, no, so that's that's a really good question. Um, so I actually am in a philosophy of religion class right now with Dr. Paul Draper, and mm -hmm. it, the, the, it's fun fact, it, like the title is literally religious experience uh, and it's mm -hmm. evidential force. So um, at least right now, my stance on that is that uh, one's own personal experience certainly can confer warrant on those who have the experience um, with respect to those experiences. So um, if for instance, it seems to you to be the case that um, God exists, or you have a, an apparent seeming or an apparent experience uh, uh, that is God speaking to you or something like that, or maybe a religious experience, 
I think that you can be justified in um, accepting that defeasibly, right? So defeasibly just means like absent further defeaters to think that you were either mistaken or wrong or so on. So I do think that you can have warrant or justification on the basis of uh, religious experience. With that being said, not everyone has uh, a kind of religious experience. And so for those who don't have it, I'm not sure that others as religious experiences should have a significant amount of evidential force for mm -hmm. them. Because, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, okay, one last thing, I want to is, um, like 15 seconds. Um, no, okay, maybe a little bit longer than that. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, like, we, we can imagine, I mean, the reason why I'm hesitant to say that someone else who doesn't have those experiences would be evidentially impacted by them is because it's really all about, like, kind of the disagreement among the varying mm -hmm. uh, religious factions yeah, yeah. about what their own experiences tell them, right? Like, mm -hmm. so like, if you told me that you went to a concert and there was a stage um, and then I knew a bunch of other people who went there and you tell me that there was a donkey on the stage, someone else tells me they didn't see anything on the stage. Another person said there were an apple on the stage. Another person said that there was a witch on the stage. Mm -hmm. Another person said that it was just a shark tank. Like, I'm not, I'm just gonna suspend judgment here. Cause I wasn't yeah, yeah. there, like, I don't really know. Like. I, I, I don't have some non-arbitrary way to arbitrate between you guys, uh, which one of you is reliable. And so, um, at least for me, I think that religious experience can confer warrant on on people who do experience it, but for those who don't, I'm not sure, so. Yeah, good stuff, and so much stuff. We'll try to squeeze in probably like three or four questions here. Um, we'll see what we can do. Uh, see you, Fredo, with the Super Chat. Thank you so much. He says, uh, regardless of God's existence, you've accepted, um, as you've accepted, what epistemic facts can you say um, agnosticism is true if the propositions of atheism or theism have not proven to be false? give facts. I guess he's trying to get you to like defend your beliefs with facts. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'm not even on the, I'm not even, I don't even own the channel, but thank you for the super chat. I appreciate <laughs> that. It's wonderful. Um, anyway, um, regardless of God's existence. Um, so agnosticism is true. So that that's something that is kind of that's a bit misplaced, right? Agnosticism can't be true or false because agnosticism is a report about one's epistemic stance and where one thinks the evidence points. So it's an epistemic thesis. And hence, it's not about what is true or false. It's rather what, about how the evidence bears on what is true or false. So, um, you know, agnosticism, that can't be true or false. Uh, the only thing that can be true or false is like a proposition, God exists. Like that's either true or false. But agnosticism, um, which is like, uh, yeah, again, it's not something that could correspond to reality. Reality itself couldn't be agnostic, right? Like, <laughs> it's not as though like reality itself it somehow is indeterminate between whether or not God exists. Like, there is a fact of the matter, right? Um, so there's a fact of the matter out there about whether or not God exists. Epistemic agnosticism talks about our epistemic stance in relation to those facts and whether or not we have evidence to think that one fact is in fact a fact as opposed to the other, right? So um, I guess that's how I would answer it. And then as to why I myself an agnostic, uh, I would recommend checking out that video, Why Am I Agnostic? It's one of my favorite videos and a lot of people have told me that. And it has like, it's crazy because my, my videos normally get only like 500 views. This That one got like over 2000, so. Hey, yeah. there you go, Joe. Um, another super chat from City Fredo. Thank you so much again for the super chat. Really appreciate the support. Uh, he says, in the proposition, does God exist? Does agnosticism provide a positive or negative answer? If positive, what does that answer? If negative, is it circular? Okay, good question. Um, so with respect to the question, does God exist? An agnostic would say um, the evidence is roughly counterbalanced between the answers of yes and no, such that uh, one simply should not affirm yes or no. So that's that's what that's what agnosticism says. So it doesn't it doesn't say yes and it doesn't say no. It says I don't know between them. Just like if I asked if I asked you guys, okay, well I'll actually do this with um, with you, Zach, right now. So <laughs> oh no, I feel there, there's there's some number of atoms in existence, right? There's 22. some number. <laughs> so there's some number of atoms in existence. Is it is it odd? Okay, I'm gonna ask you this. Yes or no, the number of atoms in the universe is odd. Yes. <laughs> in reality, I have no idea. Exactly. So you just, you don't know, right? Like the evidence you don't have, in this case, you don't have evidence, but uh, in other cases, maybe your evidence will be roughly counterbalanced. So, it, you know, sometimes you can't say yes or no, because you just don't know, right? And so that's how agnostics approach that question of does God exist, right? It's, it's like, I'm not going to say yes or no, because I just don't know. It's like similar to the odd or even number of particles. No one knows that, right? So, so um, yeah, the, the, the correct answer in the case of the particles is like, I don't know, bro. Like, um, and so the same, that's what the agnostics going to say with respect to God's existence. And of course you can flesh that out and they're going to be like, okay, well, you don't claim to know. Here's an argument for God's existence. What do you make of that? And so then you can go back and forth and debate that. 
and you can, you know, that that's when you get into the agnostics of reasons. And so I don't think there's any circularity or what, what have you. So. Awesome, bro. Uh, we have one more super chat from Steve Fredos. Thank you so much for all your support, man. Guess you really love Joe. Um, he says, if you see evidence leaning towards theism, but same at the same time for atheism to say they're both wrong, you can't just imply that you're agnostic, but there is Gnosticism. So you can be wrong for by being agnostic. Hmm. Trying to get what's going on here? No, no. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I think this this just kind of has to do with how we weigh up evidence, right? So um, it's not as though you can say that they're both wrong because we know that either God exists or either God, either God exists or God doesn't, right? So, um, you know, you someone can't say that it's false that God exists and it's false that God doesn't exist. That's a contradiction. That would imply that God both does and doesn't exist. Um, and so what that means is that having evidence for or against one side or the other, it doesn't commit you to saying they're both wrong. Rather, if it's roughly counterbalanced, you're simply withholding judgment as to which one is right, right? So um, now they, they go on, the, the person goes on to ask, um, why can't the same imply, uh, oh, that there is Gnosticism? So I'm not sure, I mean, Gnosticism would presumably just be the opposite of agnosticism, which is just instead of with, withholding judgment, you actually make a judgment as to whether or not God exists, I think. So Gnosticism would then say that, um, well, then theism or atheism, those would be kinds of, of Gnosticism, I guess. Um, and so, yes, someone can be, I, I'm just going through the, the question right now. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, okay. So yes, um, agnostics can be wrong in the sense of their assessment of the evidence can be mistaken uh, precisely because perhaps they haven't taken into account other pieces of evidence, or perhaps they've misjudged some pieces of evidence. Um, and so agnostics can be wrong. The evidence may not actually counterbalance. Um, but yeah, so agnostics can be wrong. Um, and it's not true that agnostics would have to say that both atheists and theists are, are incorrect in the sense of their positions are false. Um, it's rather a sort of withholding of, of assessment or withholding of judgment. Uh, so I think that sufficiently answers the question. Yeah, yeah. I think I like through these questions, you're basically saying that like there is an answer, but you're just not certain on what yeah. the answer maybe. Mm -hmm. Do you have time for one more question to squeeze in here? Yeah, maybe I could even do two. Yeah. Oh, okay, Joe. Um, <laughs> question from Ramon the oh, wrong question. There's a good question here. Question from Ramon the Large. He says, uh, what is the most powerful argument for theism? And also, what do you think of Jesus? Uh, good questions. So the most powerful argument for theism. Um I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I, I, I would probably say contingency arguments. So, um, like I said, I, like, I even accept stage one for the most part for, for a number of them. Uh, and stage two, um, again, I don't think it like succeeds from my perspective, but I can respect why someone would think that it succeeds, right? So I guess that is the most powerful argument for theism, cosmological arguments from contingency. Um, now, as to what do I think of, of Jesus, I haven't really researched the historical facts much. So unfortunately, I can't really say much there. I mean, I, I obviously deny like mythicism, right? Like that that's like, a con as Randall Rouser points out, that's basically like a conspiracy theory. I mean, <laughs> no serious scholar, um, note that I said serious scholar, no serious scholar denies that Jesus existed. Uh, the question is, did he do all those miraculous things? Was he the son of God? Uh, things like that. Uh, so I haven't I haven't researched the evidence for that in much depth, so I can't quite say. I mean, I mainly focus on metaphysics and philosophy of religion, so that's my main answer. I mean, you don't have like an answer for everything. <laughs> oh man, no, I can I can answer absolutely everything. Now. We need like a Joe's answer book, like a like a five hundred volume encyclopedia where it's literally just about everything in reality, uh, including how many atoms there are. Exactly. Hey, maybe you'll figure it out. Maybe there's like some sort of like lost equation. Um, it's possible. I yeah. Guess. There's also like idealism, bro. Atoms aren't necessarily even real. So, you know, just say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I have my, well, I left my George Barkley book at home, but I like it. It's, I just looked in, we'll just, I'll leave this thought, the end things. I just started looking at like the double slit experiment, like the eraser thing. And I'm just like for the first time, and I was with my roommate, I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like I yeah. had no idea. Like I was talking with one of my best friends is a physics student at Wisconsin. I was like, what's going on here? And he's like, nobody knows. Exactly. Like, it's just, the mystery is so amazing. Like I'm not yeah. even convinced it's necessarily like 
proves there's a mind, but it's just amazing how much mystery there is in reality. It, yeah, I mean, the quantum realm is like pure spook. I mean, it's crazy. It's weird. It's really weird. And like atoms, they're not these little billiard balls down there. It's like these clouds of probability, which I mean, that's like a metaphor. Like, I don't even know anywhere. <laughs> For another day, Joe. Oh my gosh. This has been so much fun, dude. Really appreciate the time. Kind of like any last thoughts you want to get out there before we wrap things up? Yeah, well, um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you guys for the questions. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to like look further into to what I do, you can check out my YouTube channel. Um, I guess that's the, the best place. Um, and yeah, The Majesty of Reason. And uh, yeah, so thank you for having me. And I, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, man, it's so much fun. There's gonna be links to everything Majesty of Reason in the description. There are now on YouTube. And do you have a podcast or is it just on the YouTube? It's just on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then it's for the podcast people. There's gonna be no link for you. You will never hear from this Joe Schmidt guy again. Um, but it's been awesome, bro. Appreciate you tuning in. Appreciate everyone who's listened. This is it here at Apologetics. If you're new here, I encourage you to subscribe. You can leave a like. Um, and if you enjoy the show, please consider supporting. You can support on Patreon.com slash it here Apologetics or through members or super chats like C. Fredo came in clutch today. Uh, thank you, everyone. Everyone for tuning in, Susan Lamont Larage, C. Heath Fredo, everyone else, Joe, it's been real, dude. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. All right, thanks for tuning in, everyone.